Welcome. In this session, I'd like to take what we talked about with data distributions and see how it plays out in practice in finance. To do that, let me start with a confession. One of the critiques of finance is that it is over dependent on the normal distribution. We use it in theory, we use it in practice, and there's there are a couple of simple reasons why you get that dependence. The first is the normal distribution, or assuming that data is normally distributed, makes life easier for you if you're a researcher or a theorist, both in theory and practice, using a normal distribution. It gives you a lot of power. The second is, finance has always had to deal with large amounts of data. The way I see it, we invented big data before it was a buzzword. And with large amounts of data, one of the advantages of using a normal distribution is you can describe the data with just two parameters the expected value and the standard deviation. In every other type of distribution, you need three or four parameters. It makes it much easier, more compact to describe the world. That said though, assuming that everything is normally distributed can get us into a lot of trouble in finance. So what I'd like to spend the bulk of this session talking about is looking at a bunch of distributions in finance, especially around prices and returns, which is where you see the normal distribution come into play and then look to see how you check to see how much you violate a normal distribution assumption, if at all. So let me start with an individual stock. Let's suppose I took annual re returns on Disney from 1962 through 2021. Disney has been publicly traded since the late 50s. And what I've done in this graph is looked at the annual returns you'd have made by putting your money in Disney stock. So basically every year I look at the change in the price and the dividend that year computed return for each year. I put up a histogram of those returns. So basically the way to read this histogram is if returns are between zero and minus 20%, they fall into this bar. So each bar captures a return. So there's actually one year where Disney was up more than 120%. Let's assume you want to check to see where returns on Disney, at least annual returns, are normally distributed. Well, one way to do it, if you have a statistics program, is to superimpose a normal distribution on this histogram to see how close you get. So the red line here is a normal distribution superimposed. Now visually, can you reject the hypothesis that distribution is normal? It's really tough to do because this distribution is close enough that it's on the one hand and the other hand. So here's a more powerful way of checking to see whether a distribution is normal. It's called the QQ plot. Put simply, here's what it does. See this black line? Those are what the observations on, in this case, annual returns on Disney would have fallen on if the distribution had been normal. So if this were a normal distribution, all of the points should be on or very close to the line. So take a look at the points. You can already see, at least for Disney, the points are mostly on the line. There are a couple of outliers. There's one over there, there's one over there. You're still visually checking for a distribution, but this data can be used to come up with tests. And I've listed a whole bunch of tests here. I won't go into the specifics of these tests. In fact, you don't even have to know how to run these tests from scratch because most statistics packages will run the test for you. Not only can they run the test, they can tell you whether you can reject the normal distribution hypothesis. You can see that of all the tests here, and there are nine, seven, you cannot reject the hypothesis that Disney annual stock returns are normally distributed. Now, in fact, a couple of the tests are pretty intuitive. Remember we said that normal distributions have no skewness? One of the tests checked to see whether the skewness in Disney returns is significantly different from zero. A normal distribution of a kurtosis of three. So one of these tests check to see whether the kurtosis is different from zero. So the common sense way of thinking about these tests is you're putting a normal distribution and checking to see whether your actual data fits. And at least for Disney, the data mostly fits. I could make statements drawing from a normal distribution Disney annual returns, including things like my average return is X percent. This is the range based on the standard deviation, and I could probably get away with it. Let's try a different stock. These are annual returns on Apple from 1981 to 2020. Now you're probably saying, why don't you go back to 1962? You know why? Because Apple's been traded only since 1980. So that 80, 1981 was the first year of full returns. Again, 
I have a histogram of returns and you can see the distribution is broader in terms of the extreme values. There were years where um, Apple's made 200% plus returns and years where it's been down 50, 60, 70%. Again, I've tried to fit a normal distribution or I made my statistics package fit and you can already see that this distribution doesn't fit as well as the Disney distribution. Again, that's a visual test. If I run a Q to Q plot and if you want to contrast this with the Disney plot, here's the Disney plot, here's the Apple annual returns plot. You can see that the deviations are larger and more significant. In fact, six of the nine tests reject the hypothesis of normality. There are three tests where it passed the test. In fact, it's interesting. Two of the tests that Disney failed on, Apple passed. You know, so, but overall, there's more evidence here to lead you to reject the normal distribution hypothesis. What does that mean? Not that you can't look at the data on Apple, but that you have to be more careful about making statements that draw on the normal distribution. Let's move one step up the ladder. Let's look at an index. In this case, let's look at the most widely followed index in the world, the S&P 500. One of the advantages you get with an index now is you don't have a single stock. You have 500 stocks pulling in different directions and you can see already how it plays out. The extremes are not as extreme. You don't get 100, 200% years, but there are big years, big positive and big negative years. Here again, it looks like the normal distribution fits pretty well, right? Even visually. And when you do the, when you do the QQ plot, you see the shop visually as well. You can see the plots are very close to the line. In fact, none of the tests reject the normality hypothesis. Annual returns on the S&P 500 are close to normally distributed. So you can make statements about S&P annual returns that you could not make with Apple because you feel more comfortable assuming a normal distribution. Now, before you jump to the conclusion that stock returns overall, especially if you're looking at an index, are normally distributed, be careful, because if I take the S&P and I look at daily returns rather than annual returns from 2016 to 2020, first your distribution becomes much more, there's a much higher peak and a much smaller tail because you're looking at daily returns. Here, there's a greater chance you will reject the normal distribution. Daily returns on the S&P 500 are less likely to be normally distributed than annual returns. Already we're starting to accumulate some common sense rules we can draw forward. It's far more likely that an index follows a normal distribution than an individual stock. It's far more likely that longer term returns like annual returns follow a normal distribution than short term returns daily or hourly or minute. So that's something you need to keep in mind as you bring the normal distribution into play. As I said in finance, we assume normal distributions because it makes life convenient. We can draw strong conclusions, make statements about the data, but there's a cost here, especially because the normal distribution doesn't fit you look, when you're looking at short-term data, daily or weekly data, and on many individual stocks. And if you force a normal distribution on data that's not normally distributed, there's a real danger. Let's take one. Let's suppose your distribution is not normal and it has fatter tails, bigger chances of extreme outcomes. Simply put, you're more likely to see you know, observations that are, that are four, five, or six standard deviations away from the mean. Remember, in a normal distribution, that almost never happens. But if your distribution is not normal, maybe there's a 10% chance of that happening. You're saying, so what? Let's suppose you devise a risk management system built on the presumption of a normal distribution. You know what you're going to do, yeah? You're basically going to devise a system for problems that are two, maybe even three standard deviations away from the mean. But beyond that, you're going to say there's so little chance of that happening, I'm not going to protect myself against it. And guess what? If you don't protect it against, against those risks and your data is not normally distributed, you are going to get hit with those uncommon risks. Thus, some of you might be familiar with Nassim Taleb's work in this area because he's been one of those people who's been yelling from rooftops about this misuse of normal distributions and how it exposes investors and companies to risk because risk management systems are, which are designed for normal distributions will not work if you have fat tails, extreme outcomes happening more frequently in your data. Now we've talked a lot about returns. 
You say, what about stock prices? Stock prices definitely cannot be normally distributed. You know why? Because the lowest stock price you can have is zero and the highest is any number. So when I take Apple daily stock prices and put them into a distribution, guess what? I get a bunching up on the left-hand side and it's clear the normal distribution is not going to fit very well. In fact, when I write my Q test, you can see this show up because the points clearly deviate from the norm. And if you look at the nine tests, eight of them reject normality. Now, if I took um, stock prices, they cannot be normally distributed. But the pushback in finance has always been, it's true, stock prices cannot be normally distributed. But what, what about log prices? In theory, you can see why log prices has a better shot of being normally distributed. The lowest stock price you can have is zero. The natural log of zero is minus infinity. Hey, you've opened up now a potential at least for something that looks like a normal distribution, right? Minus infinity to plus infinity. So, but there's no guarantee that just putting a natural log on your prices is going to make data more normal. In the case of Apple, I took those stock prices on the previous graph and took the natural logs of each of those prices. Not quite normal, but closer, right? If you want to compare this to the price, there's the Apple price, there's the Apple log price. Closer, but no cigar. Because when I try the normality tests, I reject them still on every single test, even though the points are not as deviant as they used to be. So there's Apple stock price, there's the log of the price. So for those of you who are told that if you take the log of the price, everything's going to behave normally, Listen, but verify. It might work with some stocks, but not with others. So let's summarize. When you're looking at data, the first step towards assessing what kind of distribution fits is to do a histogram. Once you've got a histogram, you can check and perhaps reject normality. But if you check and reject normality, your work has just begun. You know why? because there might be another distribution that works better than a normal distribution. I would suggest using that framework I gave you in the previous session to figure out what that distribution is. Because there is a benefit to finding a statistical distribution that works with your data. But there's some data where no standard statistical distribution will work. Don't give up, you still have the data. You can still work with the histogram, but you are going to be more limited. I hope you found the session useful and thank you very much for listening.